fourth and last session of, of today. Uh, and the, this session is about uh, uh, cryptography, or cryptography for, for the public good. Um, so it's kind of like the more technically maybe intense uh, session of the day. Hopefully you'll be able to, uh, 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 to survive this in this uh, late hour, but uh, um, let's start anyway. So, so I'll, try, I'll start with like a couple of slides of introduction and then uh, I'll lead to the, uh, to the four speakers. So I'm uh, uh, Ran Canetti, I'm a professor here at Tel Aviv University, also at Boston University, and I'm uh, 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 the uh, 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 chair of the academic committee of, this, of the ICRC who is hosting this event. Um, so um, anyway, so let me talk a bit about the cryptography. So, uh, uh, so traditionally cryptography uh, uh, has been uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, concerned uh, with basic uh, tasks that we all kind of know and, 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 and love, or at least uh, recognize, which is uh, uh, protecting communication, uh, which is encryption and, uh, and authentication of, of, of information in, you know, over the centuries and identification of people. Uh, and also, this has been going on for maybe many centuries, and this has been going on only for as long as we have the digital world, but it's still been going on for a while, which is protecting of uh, data at rest. I mean, that means encrypting data, authenticating data, but the, the functionality of, the, of, 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 of cryptography was simple. Just protect, put it in a box, which is secret, secure, and then open it up again untouched, uh, which is great, but uh, uh, in, in today's world, it's not enough. We're doing many more things with data, and cryptography, uh, developed together with, with the needs. So today, what cryptography does, what we need cryptography to do, and cryptography actually is working to do, uh, is, uh, is doing much more sophisticated things with data, with protecting data. So we can do things like uh, 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 computing on encrypted data. We have data in a box encrypted, and we do computations on the data in the box by people who don't see what they're doing, but they're still computing, and other people can see it. And we actually have heard talk about, uh, you know, about this earlier today even. Uh, so that's one thing that we can do. Uh, and so we can compute and encrypt the data. In fact, we can even compute with encrypted uh, 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 programs. Right? We can encrypt not just the data, we can also encrypt the program and run an encrypted program on an encrypted data and get results uh, and, and without learning anything, without being able to manipulate things. So that there are tools to do that. And in fact, we need them today. Um, we can do uh, what's called federated computations on, on, on private data. So we have different uh, private data that, uh, databases that are held by different parties and they don't trust each other. And they, they still they want to compute things together, get some results on their private data in a controlled way. Uh, and they can do it without comp comp compromising privacy. Uh, um, and uh, we can also authenticate computations uh, uh, that are done by untrusted people on untrusted platforms, we can authenticate or verify the correctness of results of computations. Uh, um, and we can also provide this immutable public uh, logs of history of the, 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 uh, all those uh, ledgers that we, uh, uh, we know and love. And this is new things, new functionality that, that cryptography is given. And, 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 and this new functionality is really uh, 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 enables a uh, much better world uh, than uh, what we had and maybe even within what we have today because we can uh, democratize knowledge. Now people can be in charge of their own data. It doesn't need to uh, all belong to some co corporations or big conglomerates of, uh, of that hold information and we still get the utility as if the data was all aggregated in one place. Uh, we can do things like balancing uh, uh, public safety with liberty, personality, privacy, all the things that we talked about uh, earlier today. I mean, the technology exists. We still don't know as a society how to use it, but technology is there that cryptography gives it. Uh, um, and, uh, uh, and, and also, uh, as we'll actually see in the first talk, you know, cryptography really enables like a, a new type of economy, a, glo a, a really flat, non-hierarchical, global, border-free economy, a uh, payment system and a whole economic system that could potentially change the way the world works and how governments work and how we structure as citizens of the world, how we structure our society. Uh, uh, so, so this is uh, the new world of cryptography. And, uh, and the four talks that we will have today, um, 
touch seconds, are uh, uh, going to going to touch several different options, the, the several different aspects of uh, uh, of, uh, of of this uh, new cryptography. So first, we'll hear uh, uh, Alessandro Pieza, which is a professor from Berkeley, talk about uh, 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 digital money, about Bitcoin, and how to make it really uh, private, digital, more like digital cash. Uh, uh, we'll have uh, Alison Lefko, which is a professor at Columbia, which will talk about this concept of program obfuscation or program encryption, how to work with encrypted programs that you don't even see what you're doing. Uh, uh, you can hide information in code and uh, uh, the amazing things that you can do with it. Uh, then we'll hear, we'll hear from uh, Raluca da Popa, which is a professor in Berkeley again, uh, uh, which is kind of like goes a little bit back, goes back to uh, the, you know, the, the traditional uh, 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 task of end-to-end -end communication, but in today's world, which becomes much more uh, 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 complex, as Steve Villavan earlier said, that today even mail, sending a mail from one end to the other is really not a, such a simple task. There are so many <coughs> intermediaries in the way, so Raluca is trying to solve that. Uh, um, and, and lastly, we'll hear from uh, Adia Kavya, who is a professor uh, in Haifa University as of this fall, uh, and she's going to talk about this technology of multi-party computation, which allows us to, to share information between mutually distrustful parties to get some global good, some global uh, uh, utility from this information without, uh, 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 without uh, compromising privacy. So, without further ado, let me uh, just invi invite uh, uh, Ale, the first speaker. So. Thank you, Ran. Uh, let me get accent. Okay. Oh, okay, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so today, I want to uh, tell you a little bit about Bitcoin, uh, its privacy problem, and how we're going to fix it. Okay. So I'm going to spend just two very quick slides, just so we can load state about uh, some high-level features of Bitcoin, and we're going to quickly move on to discuss uh, some of its limitations and uh, a, a specifically how they have to do with privacy. So <clears throat> Bitcoin is the first digital currency that has uh, achieved uh, widespread adoption. It has a really unusual birth uh, as far as cryptography, cryptography goes, goes. There is a, a, a well-known and empirically tested mantra, which is don't roll your own crypto. Like, you know, you should first uh, designed inside academia, have it peer-reviewed, eventually carefully implement it, and then, only then, maybe it will kind of uh, uh, withstand the practical adoption. Uh, actually, Bitcoin came from a very unusual source, un totally unlike this, which was basically a white paper dropped on a forum about 10 years ago, followed by, uh, 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 shortly thereafter, corresponding code for uh, running the client and uh, has seen a very rap rapid growth. I have to keep updating these numbers every time I give this talk. Uh, <clears throat> more, most, most recently had a market cap of $110 billion uh, with a supply of 17 million coins, each at $7,500. And there's lots of daily trades spread across various exchanges. These are exchanges just like uh, for uh, normal securities, except that they're about cryptocurrencies, okay? And there, there, there are many exchanges around the world and there are people trading, so Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. Um, there's, you can also like uh, get Bitcoin directly at uh, uh, bankomats uh, around the world. And uh, uh, what, can you, what can you do? Can you actually do anything beyond trading? Uh, and there's a, grow, there's a growing list of uh, uh, online stores and uh, uh, charities that will ac accept, gladly accept your Bitcoin uh, 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 as a form of payment. So I wanted to mention that it's actually not the first time that cryptography and uh, um, the notion of cash or uh, currencies meet. Actually, it's a classical problem that cryptographers have been trying to look into. How do we achieve uh, digital forms of cash? Because uh, as our economy sort of transcends borders and you know, takes on a global scale, obviously it is much more um, efficient and economical to uh, adopt digital forms of cash. And uh, <coughs> cryptographers have been looking at the problem of how do we do it in a way that is privacy preserving and doesn't trust uh, uh, banks as much. So for example, even going back to 
notions such as of David Chalms of uh, eCash and of Sander and Tashma who looked at uh, uh, verifiable banks. Uh, it's something that cryptographers have looked at for a while, but somehow, uh, 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 and despite even very explicit direct entrepreneurial attempts by cryptographers to try to get some of these ideas out in the wild, nothing worked. Uh, now we live in a very different world where Bitcoin uh, 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 came off from a different <coughs> direction and uh, uh, um, so, so surprised the community uh, uh, by uh, suddenly becoming sort of adopted. So, okay, that's kind of the, some facts. I just want to sort of take a step back and say, you know, if you've never heard of Bitcoin or maybe you have heard of Bitcoin, I want to try to separate in your mind different aspects of it because we'll only be focusing on one particular aspect. So you can think of Bitcoin as made up of three particular components. One of them is a, which you can, you can think about as a consensus layer. Essentially, it's just a peer-to-peer -peer protocol, like just a distributed algorithm that can be run by uh, parties that realizes uh, some ideal functionality. What is this ideal functionality? Is an append-only ledger. So it's just a list of events that have happened in a system. It's a way for parties to come together, exchange messages, and agree on what events have happened in a linear fashion. Okay? So basically, in the end, what is an append-only ledger is just a sequence of transactions. Okay? So transaction 11, followed by transaction 12, 13, 14. Now there's a new transaction being broadcast. We are basically running some protocol to decide on which next transaction we're gonna append, okay? So this is what, there's nothing about payments here. It's just about linearizing transactions without having any central party to mediate, mediate this agreement essentially, okay? So agreement naturally arises out of the protocol. Uh, now in the particular case of Bitcoin, it uh, leverages this mechanism for achieving consensus to basically realize a payment system. How do you do it? Well, you just decide that each transaction will be interpreted as a payment, okay? So each, inside each transaction, okay, I'm, obviously I'm oversimplifying, but what you will find is several fields that correspond to the details of a particular payment that was contained in that transaction, okay? So there is a, 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 there is a sender, okay, in this case is Alice, there is a receiver, Bob, there's the amount of the payment, okay? And then of course there's some authenticating information that says, yes, Alice did really authorize this payment to go through, and you know, here's a digital signature under her public key, okay? And <clears throat> clearly, you know, as you, as you have all of, these payment, all of these payment transactions recorded in a linear way that everybody agrees on, you can immediately achieve a, a, sort of a, a, a payment system. The reason why uh, this is a payment system is it's important for the payment system security that everybody agrees on, this, on the <coughs> transactions because if, if you look, at, for example, on the last transaction there, how do we know that Bob can send one unit of currency to Eve? Because everybody can check that earlier on there was a transaction that Bob did receive a unit of currency and in inter an intervening time he didn't spend it, okay? So if Bob were to try to spend that same unit of currency twice, then so it would be apparent to everybody in the system and such a transaction would not be appended to the ledger, okay? So together, signed payments, yeah, signed payments and a consensus protocol give you together uh, a, a payment system. At a high level, that should be like a pretty clear uh, sort of combination, okay? There's a third component, actually, uh, that's not necessarily obvious uh, why it's needed and is incentive to participate, okay? So for the, protocol, for the distributed protocol to uh, exist, you need to have parties that actually run the protocol itself. So why would anybody uh, participate in this protocol? So in the particular case of Bitcoin, uh, there are uh, sort of ingrained in the system some uh, 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 reward mechanisms for participating in this protocol, okay? So you might have heard of like mining rewards, uh, doesn't really matter right now. Just at a very high level, three components, consensus protocol, some way to fill in transactions, to talk about payments, and lastly, like some reward mechanisms so that people are incentivized to uh, participate in the protocol to begin with. That's all I really want to say about Bitcoin. Now let's talk about its <coughs> challenges, okay? So Bitcoin actually, uh, you know, this, its success is uh, surprising in many ways. One of them is that uh, it, it managed to have cryptography widely adopted, which is by itself, uh, uh, whether it is pay about payments or about anything else, that, that's already like a major feat. But <clears throat> more than that, it has many, many challenges that sort of uh, it, it will have to be addressed if uh, technologies such as these are to be used for sort of more serious applications beyond sort of trading currencies online, a few exchanges, which is great. Sorry, great penetration of cryptography into sort of the uh, uh, 
society, but it's not you know, by in by itself very useful. It's not yet a public good, right? One of them is governance. Uh, in these peer-to-peer -peer systems, because they're peer-to-peer, -peer, there's nobody there that can you know, take decisions on behalf of the community. So, and already the Bitcoin community has so succumbed to governance issues where there were different factions of the community that had different opinions how the protocol should look like and sort of the protocol, the, this, uh, a, 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 the community sort of separated into multiple sub-communities that are running sort of different protocols. So, at a very high level, there's a, there's a beautiful question here with both theoretical and, 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 and practical uh, applications, which is how do you take a peer-to-peer -peer system and sort of have it self-evolve, okay, into the future when you realize, well, we should change this, and some other person says, well, I think we should change this other way, how do you resolve these differences of opinions in a peer-to-peer -peer system? Efficiency, right now, Bitcoin, even though it's, uh, it is, let's say, widely used, it's not really widely used. The number of transactions that it can process as a system is actually pretty, it's pretty lame, actually. It's just uh, you know, a few tens of transactions uh, uh, per second. And uh, in, 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 uh, if eventually, if one wants to use these technologies for anything serious, you will have to have to scale up to handling, say, thousands or hundreds of thousands of transactions per second. Uh, there's also a question of you know, if you want to use it for pricing anything and you, know, you want to have to rewrite the prices for uh, the goods in your store, like, every hour, uh, we need some sort of a, a macroeconomic view to try to understand how do we design systems so that the, uh, uh, um, the way they're traded in, is in a non-volatile way. There are many challenges today. I want to specifically focus on a very concrete one, which has to do with privacy, okay? And uh, this is where my colleagues and I have, uh, have worked on it, and we think we have something interesting to say uh, on this front. So let me tell you about some of the privacy problems of Bitcoin, okay? Other questions so far? We're good. All right. So first, let me just sort of uh, uh, state that uh, sort of payment history of an individual or of an entity, like a corporation or a business, reveals lots of information. So what kind of information? It could reveal medical information. So for example, if you pay a particular doctor, that doctor will have a specialty. And that specialty may betray sort of uh, uh, what kind of diseases you, diseases you suffer from. And such information, you would like to keep it private because it can be exploited by businesses. For example, insurance companies could use such information to uh, modify the premium that you pay or even deny coverage. Uh, whether you buy coffee, say in Tel Aviv University or in Boston or in Milan or w whatnot, obviously you know, says something about where you are, right, on, on planet Earth. And you know, this could be mined by you know, starklers, burglars, you know, or in some countries even assassins, right, so to know where you are. And uh, if you take the view of, say, not necessarily an individual of a business, sort of the, the, the transactions you conduct are clearly sort of business intelligence you want to keep to yourself, right? <coughs> so, of course, this is obvious, right? And, and not by chance, the financial industry is one of the most regulated industries, perhaps second only to the, uh, uh, to the medical uh, uh, and, and health in, uh, uh, sort of businesses, okay? Because they're they're handling, on a daily basis, extremely confidential information of individuals and, and uh, businesses and various entities, okay? So, <clears throat> okay, so what does it have to do with Bitcoin? So, well, let's, look, let's go back to Bitcoin. What happens in Bitcoin? So, here, each transaction actually re states a sender, a recipient, an amount, and, a, and uh, uh, by virtue of when the transaction happens, also the time of when the payment was made, for every single payment that is processed by the network, okay? And you might wonder, well, it's not really revealing the sender and the receiver. If you actually open up and look at what happens in Bitcoin, you, the, the sender is just a sequence of, uh, it's a string that is the sender's address, okay? And the recipient is, in the recipient field, you don't find the name of a business or name of an individual, you will find the recipient's address, okay? So you're not really revealing uh, payment information. Well, <laughs> Maybe. So if you'll talk to cryptographers, uh, uh, this kind of information, <laughs> yes, there, are, there isn't first and last name and social security numbers, but the, the cash flow from, addressed, from addresses to further addresses and uh, uh, sort of coupled with when they're occurring, this is sort of uh, lots of information that can be mined. And uh, so uh, these addresses, first and foremost, you know, you know the address of yourself and necessarily of the address of the people you interact with, I mean, your friend or the coffee shop that you have to pay at some point, right? So you actually know 
the, uh, the correspondence between some addresses and some actual people and, and businesses in the real world, right? And <clears throat> it's not like this information is ephemeral. You know, it gets, it gets attached to this uh, ever-growing list of all payments and it's there for anybody to read, right? And so visually you can imagine that, you know, as payments are processed by the network, there is this implied transaction graph that uh, tracks and basically tells the entire world how money is moving between addresses. And very quickly, you can take this transaction graph and, and uh, correlate it with side information from the real world, and uh, these addresses become real people, okay? They become so-called de-anonymized. And it's not just a theoretical concern, it was actually literally used in an FBI investigation to, uh, 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 as part of the, 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 the criminal proceedings, some of the evidence that eventually led to certain indictments, w part of it was tying addresses and people and sort of using sort of the public information available in Ledger as evidence to indict uh, 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 and, and prosecute uh, 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 so various criminals that were selling drugs on, on using Bitcoin. So, and moreover, so there's lots of academic studies that say that, you know, this graph, you know, not surprisingly contains lots of information and you know, it's bad, okay? So, now, when people started realizing this, they said, well, you know, you can easily mitigate it. Just never reuse the same address. Just always use a different address, okay, for every payment that you're making, okay? So you're kind of trying to kind of cover your tracks, okay? So to try to make the, the, the patterns uh, less, uh, um, less obvious, okay? And uh, you could also try to get together with your friends and mix your money together. So you could try, you know, to get a trusted friend, you know, a group of friends give all their money to the trusted friend who can get gains after that, RISP distributes the money again, right? This is some sort of uh, standard money laundering technique used to protect yourself uh, 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 from sort of covering your tracks. And uh, so it seems harder to analyze, but again, sort of people have looked at it from a formal perspective and uh, you can still sort of use machine learning and sort of data analysis to try to, and you will extract lots of information. So, and again, the amount of information is known about the ledger only increases. It's not like tomorrow there's going to be more privacy than there was today. Maybe tomorrow something else gets de-anonymized and that de-anonymized information will further enable additional de-anonymization. So over time, basically, you know, the, the, the methods of analysis and how much is known about the transaction graph just always grows, okay? So privacy in Bitcoin is bad and only gets worse day by day, okay? So and even if you don't care about privacy, there are separate economic reasons for why uh, uh, you should care about this, uh, uh, the fact that uh, cash flow is, uh, is explicit on, uh, on Bitcoin. It has to do with fungibility, okay? So with normal cash, it's actually a feature that when you pull out like a $20 bill from your wallet, uh, there isn't the pedigree of where this $20 bill has been in its life, okay? Um, <clears throat> And in Bitcoin, it's not like that. When you pay somebody, this person could say, well, hold on a second, you know, which Bitcoin did you want to use to pay me? Because I want to inspect its history and see if I agree with it, okay? And <clears throat> this means that to some extent, the value of a coin is not even well-defined because different people will, can value the same coin differently. The same person could value different coins differently. And as a general heuristic, coins that have a short history are more valuable than ones that have a long history, okay? Because more people could have opinions about a history, right? And now it seems like we're again going back to a central situation where there are certain parties that are going to vouch or uh, um, sort of uh, 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 ensure coins that for could have been, one could discover they have uh, gone through sort of uh, 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 maybe illicit activities at which point people could just value them much less. So there are economic reasons for why having this history explicit is bad. So, but if privacy and fungibility is so important, why, why isn't Bitcoin private, okay? Why did you know, whoever you know, designed the system not bake into uh, the design something that had to do with privacy? In fact, if you roll back 10 years ago, Bitcoin was heralded on forums as a, as a private payment system, okay? But it's, it's far from it, okay? It's, it's less private than using credit cards, for example, right? Because if you use a credit card, you're telling your financial history to your bank, and that's it, okay? And potentially, you know, any auditors that are like, you know, scrutinizing the bank's uh, 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 books and whatnot, right? With Bitcoin, you're telling your financial uh, uh, transactions to everybody, including the bank, okay? So you're strictly worse off, okay? So 
Why wasn't Bitcoin designed to be private? Well, let's go back to the, uh, to the way that uh, <coughs> payments are recorded. How do we know that Bob has a unit of currency? Because we, can, we actually have in front of us the history of all payments, so we can just go and see directly in a trivial way, yeah, Bob has money. That's, that's why he can spend it, because I can see when he received it. Right? Uh, and if we just take the sort of naive reaction and just say, well, secret information, just encrypt it, okay? Just make all the payments be encrypted transactions. Now, sort of the integrity of the system goes out the window because when I see the last transaction, I see a bunch of ciphertexts and I'm scratching my head. It's like, I don't know whether it's a valid payment or not. Maybe Bob is double spending his coin, right? So somehow the fact that Bitcoin is not private is used for its own security, its own integrity, okay? So it seems like, like the security of the system and privacy are really like a, a, at odds, okay? And <coughs> so in one minute, I'm gonna tell you about how one can resolve this, uh, a, 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 um, or maybe two minutes, how one can resolve this, uh, a, 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 um, this tension. And this is uh, a, a, something I worked on with my colleagues a few years ago. It's uh, called Zero Cash. It's, uh, a, it's, a, it's a protocol that ach tries to achieve or achieves uh, um, sort of features of Bitcoin, a like peer-to-peer -peer payment system, without compromising on any way in privacy. Okay. So, in what I mean, something like Bitcoin, it's going to be an, a, a system that is built in an append-only ledger. So it's a peer-to-peer -peer system. It is privacy-preserving. What do I mean? Concretely, every payment has Three pieces, okay. I've just been awarded two minutes, that's wonderful. <laughs> had, uh, a payment has three crucial pieces of information that you want to hide, the sender, the receiver, and the amount, okay? This system hides all three, provably, okay? So when you see a transaction, all you, s all you learn is that it represents a valid payment, but you don't know from whom, to whom, or by how much, okay? And last but not least, it's very important because cryptography has uh, many magical solutions, that most of which cannot fit inside this universe. This particular, this particular protocol actually does not just fit in the universe, but actually fits in a machine, and uh, it gives you parameters that are actually quite reasonable for, uh, for a, a system like Bitcoin. We have transactions that are you know, less than a kilobyte in size, and uh, only take a few milliseconds to verify. So what's the high-level idea for uh, doing something like that? Sounds very magical. Well, let's go back to the notion of uh, uh, encrypting uh, uh, um, payments, that was like a reasonable direction to go to. The main problem there was that we didn't know underneath the ciphertext what kind of inf information was there. At the very high level, what we're going to do is we're going to attach an additional piece of information to a transaction, something that we call a cryptographic proof. Okay, it's going to be a proof that is going to be a making an assertion. Okay, it's going to assert that the plain texts underneath the ciphertexts represent a valid payment, but the proof itself is not going to reveal, okay, what those details of the payments are. It's just gonna assert in a, proof of, in, a, in a way that can be checked that whatever that payment is must be valid, okay? So in this way, whenever say Alice is producing a new transaction, she's going to broadcast you know, these uh, uh, three ciphertexts for sender, receiver, and the amount, along with a, a proof that says, look, this ciphertext contain encryptions of a sender address, a receiver address, and a transfer amount, okay? And you know, the third parties may not believe her, right? So that's why she will attach a cryptographic proof that, you know, all of these assertions are actually true, okay? And obviously, you know, here is just a high-level idea. And crucially here, we need to agree on you know, what kind of cryptographic proof is used and what exactly is the statement that she's proving uh, because, you know, right now it's just like a, a, a box of English, right? At some point, one has to sort of distill from this box of English some concrete mathematical statement, a theorem actually, whose, pro you know, whose uh, truth is being asserted by the cryptographic proof. So at a very high level, uh, essentially, you know, we need proofs and uh, what is a proof? It's something for which it is, you're able to produce valid looking proofs only if the statement is true and if what you're trying to prove is false then you cannot produce good-looking proofs, okay? Uh, they have to be non-interactive, so, so you can write them down. It's actually, in cryptography, uh, most proofs end up being interactive. This is actually something that uh, a, a, a we cannot use here. They really specifically have to be non-interactive. And there's this pr property, crucial property, is called zero knowledge. Uh, I don't have time to talk about it here. I encourage you to kind of read about it online. It's a beautiful notion uh, uh, that was invented, introducing cryptography in the 80s. And essentially, it says that you can 
you, you can assert properties about the, in this case, a payment without actually revealing details about the payment itself, okay? So you can prove a theorem, convince somebody that the theorem is true, and yet, in a provable way, <laughs> the proof itself will not contain any information about the proof of that theorem, okay? In this case, the theorem is, I have a valid payment. And, you know, these proofs are going to be small, and this is something you may have seen in a, sort of in, a, in, a, in, a, in media outlets as something called the ZK-SNARKs, okay? Something that, you know, I worked on uh, in my PhD with, uh, with my, many of my esteemed colleagues, and uh, something that uh, we have designed and built, and it's one of the engines for implementing a system like the one I've just described, okay? So I think I want to uh, um, stop here at high level, because uh, uh, what, what, what I've not told you, maybe like you can read about it later online, is is a, once you have these proofs, uh, one, one, okay, one aspect is you need to construct these proofs somehow, okay? And you know, the, the, uh, uh, if you're interested about references for how, how to do that and where you can learn about them, um, you can ask me offline later. And separately, once you have these proofs, then uh, uh, the way to turn this high-level approach into a, a, a working protocol is you need to actually distill uh, you know, what is an address in this particular system, what is a coin, what does it mean for a coin to not be double spent, you give formal meanings to all these things, and eventually can you package all of these into a statement that says the plain text underneath the ciphertext represent a payment that is valid, has not been double spent. Okay, and we can do all this formally and have a proof attest to that. And then this gives you a privacy preserving analog of Bitcoin that is peer-to-peer, -peer, you know, has this integrity, and yet, provably, uh, reveals no information about uh, uh, any payment that is being conducted on the network. Um, all right, thank you. <laughs>